Om Namah Shivaya Sadhguru. Om Namah Shivaya Sadhguru. Om Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu, Ma Bindishavahai Om Shanti 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 Turn on screen share. And we should all see raising children as good Hindus. Do we see that? Yes, we do. Okay. Very good. Today we are continuing our new series entitled Raising Children as Good Hindus. And as I mentioned last time, it's <clears throat> going to be the Educational Insights section in the April... 2021 issue of Hinduism today, and therefore it's just currently being printed. The material divides into nine Zoom satsangs. This is our second one. And as I mentioned, Obviously, those who have pre-teenage children, it's perfect. Some grandparents are putting in lots of time raising their grandchildren. That works, obviously. And for adults, as I mentioned last time, the material still applies, but many of the points you'll be doing very well. There's no need to focus on them. You just Choose the ones where you know you could make some improvement. Focus on those. And of course we have our normal questions. Do you need something to write down your answers? Challenge your brain. This is the second one, as I mentioned. Close the window here. And it's in three parts. Sections. The first section is on cultivating nine key spiritual qualities. Or up to the second quality. The second quality to develop is perceptive self-correction. Perceptive self-correction is evident when we are able to quickly learn the lesson from each experience and resolve not to repeat our mistakes. <clears throat> That's the idea of what we want in an adult. So we're trying to train children so that when they reach adulthood, they're able to do that. Lots of people rely on others to help them sort out when they make a mistake. So it's more efficient if you can rely on yourself and know how to quickly learn the lesson and resolve not to repeat our mistakes. Okay, first question. How do parents develop this quality in children or in themselves? Perceptive self-correction. By teaching them that making mistakes is not bad. Everyone makes mistakes. 
it is natural and simply shows we do not understand something. Story. I have met many individuals who were moving forward positively with their plans, but then they made a significant mistake and basically fell apart and lost their positive momentum because of self-doubt. This can happen because they were raised with the belief that they should never make a mistake, that they always needed to be perfect. I like to jokingly say if anyone was perfect, he or she would not have been born in the first place. No reason to be born if you're already perfect. Everyone on earth shares the quality of not being perfect and therefore on occasion makes mistakes. But we want to balance that out. However, they also share the quality that the inside, the soul, is already perfect. The outside is imperfect, the inside is perfect and divine. That's the Hindu viewpoint. What should parents do when their children make mistakes? It is important for the parent to determine what understanding the child lacks and teach it to him without blame. Blame just complicates everything. When parents discipline through natural and logical consequences, children are encouraged to learn to reflect on the possible effects of their behavior before acting. So that's ideal. We reflect enough before acting that we avoid certain mistakes because of that reflection. Such wisdom can be nurtured through encouraging self-reflection by asking the child to think about what he or she did and how, that, how he or she could avoid making that mistake again. Perceptive self-correction enables young ones to quickly learn from their inevitable mistakes, refine their still developing behavior accordingly, and thereby make more rapid progress on the spiritual path. Gurudeva observed, children are entrusted to their parents to be loved, guided, and protected, for they are the future of the future. However, children can be a challenge to raise up into good citizenship. There are many positive ways to guide them, such as hugging, kindness, time spent explaining, giving wise direction, setting the example of what you want them to become. The second section presents one of Hinduism's wise precepts. So we're on the second precept, which is that Hindus hold a deep reverence toward planet Earth, toward all living beings that dwell on it. <clears throat> Many thoughtful people share the Hindu view that it is not right for man to kill or harm animals for food or sport. They believe that animals have a right to enjoy living on this planet as much as humans do. There is a Vedic verse in this regard that says, Ahinsa is not causing pain to any living being at any time. Through the actions of one's mind, speech, or body. Another Vedic verse states, you must not use your God-given body for killing God's creatures, whether they are human, animal, or whatever. Hindus regard all living creatures as sacred, mammals, fishes, birds, and more. They are stewards of trees and plants, fish and birds, bees and reptiles, animals and creatures of every shape and kind. How do these Hindu teachings differ from how do these Hindu teachings differ from some other religions?
The answer is that some other religions are only concerned about not harming mankind. Hinduism adds to that not harming all living creatures. So that's an important difference. <clears throat> all religions say you don't harm man, but not all of them say you don't harm all living creatures. But Hinduism is one of the ones that does. We acknowledge this reverence for life and our special affection for the cow. Mahatma Gandhi once said about the cow, one can measure the greatness of a nation and its moral progress by the way it treats its animals. He said, cow protection to me is not mere protection of the cow. It means protection of all that lives and is helpless and weak in the world. The cow means the entire subhuman world. Many individuals are concerned about our environment and properly preserving it for future generations. Hindus share this concern and honor and revere the world around them as God's creation. They work for the protection of the Earth's diversity and resources to achieve the goal of a secure, sustainable, and lasting environment. So Hindus are environmentalists. Our third section is on imparting beliefs and attitudes. First idea in this section is to take responsibility for being the primary teachers of Hinduism to your children. There's a few different ideas in this section. That's the first one. Take responsibility for being the primary teachers of Hinduism to your children. It is wonderful that many temples have in place educational programs for the youth that are both effective and popular. However, it is important for parents to have the attitude that these programs supplement but do not replace the need for them to teach Hinduism to their children in the home. This is because if the parents are also involved in the study, there is much greater potential for actually augmenting Hindu culture and religious conversations in the home. In fact, some Hindu groups will not accept children into classes unless the parents also enroll in a parallel study for adults. And we have our story. One of our devotees a number of years ago was responsible for the Sunday morning Hinduism classes for a group in Singapore. He found that parents would commonly drop the children off, go shopping for two hours, return and pick them up, all the while expecting the teachers to make their children better Hindus. Though this approach works for learning the fine arts, <clears throat> such as dancing or playing an instrument, it does not work for Hinduism. The difference is this. For children to learn dance or music, the parents need not know how to dance or play the instrument. However, for Hinduism to be learned, it is necessary for the whole family to practice it together. This is because Hinduism is an all-encompassing spiritual way of life, informing every aspect of the family's daily and weekly routine, and not just what happens in the shrine room. Parents are indeed the first guru. They teach in different ways. That's our question. What are the different ways that parents teach? The different ways in which parents teach are by example, explanation, feedback, and giving advice and direction. Parents follow a systematic approach to teaching children Hinduism during the formative years. Sanatana Dharma will be fully integrated into their minds 
assuring that it will be with them for life. Formative years means up to the teens. Every child isn't exactly the same, but if you chose 13, for example, and then you'd have the goal of getting everything you want your children to learn about Hinduism into their minds before they turn 13. Why is that? Because at some point in the teens, they stop wanting to listen to you, which is actually a positive thing because they're digesting what they already learned, seeing what they think versus what their parents think. So you want to get it in during the formative years, which is before age 13 to be safe. Next idea in this section. Without your help, there is no guarantee that your children will follow their faith as adults. Look around at the younger generation of Hindus and you will find many who have no interest whatsoever in the Hindu religion. 100 years ago, before movies, television, and computers, in the cities and villages of India and Hindu communities in other countries, the Hindu temple was the most interesting place in town. Besides the pujas and festivals, there were dramas, dances, discourses, and musical concerts. The temple was a social and educational center as well. In our modern world, we have compelling movies, television, and computers, and many Hindu children would, rather, would much rather spend their free time enjoying these with their friends than being at the temple. Why is this? There are many reasons. Nowadays, families are not so close. It used to be far easier to get children to come to the temple since it was the center of village life and there wasn't much competition. Also, nowadays, it's further away. It's not just a part of the village away. Today's children often consider the temple boring compared to the all-pervasive and ever more compelling secular forms of entertainment that are available. Thus, parents are challenged more than ever to answer kids' puzzling queries, as grandparents did not have to do by giving sensible, pragmatic explanations of temple worship and Hinduism's rich array of cultural and mystical practices. Kids today want answers that make sense to them. They are not at all content with, that's the way we have always done it. When parents are unable to meet this challenge, Hinduism does not become meaningful and useful to their children. Many youth today do not have the view. Many youth today do not view the practice of their faith as important to making their life happier and more successful. This is the challenge every Hindu parent faces, but all is not lost. New generations are eager to hear the lofty truths, and those truths can be explained in ways that engage and inspire young seekers, counterbalancing the magnetic influences of the modern world. Oh, an important point there. Making their life happier and more successful. I have a pub desk just on that idea. It's something about rules and tools. Unfortunately, Hinduism is presented as a set of rules, which looks like it's taking the fun out of life, instead of a set of tools, which can actually help us live a happier and more successful life. So that how to do that is it requires good thought. Hinduism is in no way more dynamically strengthened in the lives of children and the family than by. The answer is given in the section title here. Establish a shrine in the home. That's the answer. 
Hinduism is in no way more dynamically strengthened in the lives of children and the family than by establishing a shrine in the home. The home shrine works best when it is an entire room. That way it can be strictly reserved for worship and meditation, unsullied by worldly talk or other activities. This is the ideal. However, when that is not possible, it should at least be a quiet corner of a room more than a simple shelf or cabinet. So, of course, not all Hindu teachers put as much stress on that as Gurudeva did. But to him, you know, he visited lots of Hindu homes and became very observant of how many of them didn't have a significant shrine. You know, they had a picture in the doorway or something simple, but they didn't have a shrine that really had a vibration. So it became one of his strong points to bring up regularly. As we found out last Zoom satsang, the material, when it's divided into nine parts, is a little short. But it divides quite naturally into nine parts because different, the different sections have nine points. So to make this satsang a little longer, I've added another section. And we're looking at the concept of spirituality versus religion, how they're different, or being spiritual versus being religious. And we're going to do this from a few different viewpoints. And the first one is this publisher's desk. Be a spiritual leader. Uplift the spirit of everyone you meet by expressing kindness, gratitude, appreciation, and encouragement. July 2011, pub desk. This publisher's desk presents my thoughts on the difference between the nature of a spiritual leader and the nature of a religious leader. And today we will look at part one of two parts. So we'll look at part two next time. So I'll be reading from the publisher's desk here. From August 28th through 31 of the year 2000, there was an historic meeting in New York City. 2,000 of the world's preeminent religious and spiritual leaders representing the many faith traditions gathered at the United Nations for a Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious and Spiritual Leaders to pledge themselves to work for peace. They met in the General Assembly Hall. It was an historical first. Gurudeva was instrumental in getting a strong Hindu presence at the event and was among the Hindu delegates. So that in the middle there is Sambhamurti Shivacharya, very, the late Sambhamurti Shivacharya, very highly respected Shivacharya from Chennai, who was the head of the 10 India Archika Sangam for quite some time, and those are his sons. So Gurudeva helped them get there. Very nice. Speaking at one gathering into the press, he delivered the message for world peace, stop the war in the home. So well, that's a true Gurudevaism, just very direct and powerful. Doesn't beat around the bush, as we say. For world peace, what do you have to do? Stop the war in the home. So we're looking more in the microcosm not out in the macrocosm of the world. The macrocosm of the world reflects what happens within the microcosm of the home. And that was published as his publisher's desk in November 2000 issue. To quote the talk here, when asked by the United Nations leaders how humanity might better resolve the conflicts, hostilities, and violent happenings that plague every nation, 
I answered that we must work at the source and cause, not with the symptoms. That is what we do in Ayurvedic medicine. Focus on the causes, on establishing the body's natural balance and health. That way we are not always working with illness and disease. We are spending time and resources instead to establish a healthy system that itself fights off sickness. To stop the wars in the world, our best long-term solution is to stop the war in the home. It is here that hatred begins, that animosities with those who are different from us are nurtured, that battered children learn to solve their problems with violence. So we've got to get to homes functioning well. I presented an idea that has some similarity to that in Perth, Australia, for a Kum Babishikam there at the Shiva temple. And the it's Western Australia is the province, so a high official in the Western Australia provincial government, they sat him next to me. And I knowing he was coming, I gave a talk which made a similar point that Having a Hindu temple in your community where you can go regularly to worship creates more peace within the individual, more harmony within the home, and greater tolerance in the community. So that's the value of a Hindu temple for those who regularly go, actually helping the entire community. That UN summit caused me to reflect on the difference between a religious leader and a spiritual leader. It was a new reflection. I had never thought about what's the difference? Aren't they the same thing? <laughs> Religion and spirituality. I, I concluded they were different. The conclusion I came to is a religious leader is a leader of a recognized religion. A spiritual leader is someone who is expert in uplifting the spirit of others. Some religious leaders are also spiritual leaders, and some are not. Some spiritual leaders are also religious leaders, and some are not. So that's not a criticism, because they're doing what's, what they're supposed to do within their respective traditions. It's just that traditions differ. Gurudeva was definitely both. In fact, he was an expert in uplifting the spirit of others, no matter what their religion or ethnicity. How did he accomplish this? By speaking encouraging words to individuals and groups alike. You too can be a spiritual leader. It's not that hard. Probably oh, never thought about that. Simply make it a point to say something encouraging, complimentary, and high-minded to everyone you meet. Their day will be brighter because of it, and so will yours. Your words may be just what they needed to escape a moody morning and discover a new energy for the day. Isn't that what spiritual leaders do? Change the energy, elevate the spirit so people connected so people connect with their intuition and open themselves to the highest course of action for the day. So for you to be a spiritual leader at this time is particularly good because there are many people who are in a negative mood due to the pandemic, bringing extra hardships to them, more hardships than they're used to facing, and so it's natural to become negative negative some or all of the time. But if you're in a positive state of mind, you can be a spiritual leader by saying something encouraging. Very simple. How do we do this more specifically? When encountering people you know, you can ask about some aspects of their life, such as their children or recent travel, and show an interest in their well-being. 
Gurudeva was skilled at this form of empathy. As a result, he was an important source of upliftment and encouragement for many people on the Hawaiian island of Kauai from all walks of life. <clears throat> so that's very unusual for the manual workers on the island all the way up to the head of the hospital and the head of the government. Many of them in all these different categories were uplifted by Gurudeva. So we had a way of just reaching out to everyone. Meetings are excellent opportunities for encouraging others. Listen attentively to each individual's ideas, and when they are good ideas, be sure to compliment them. Someone is trying hard or is a bit shy in presenting an idea. Make a few encouraging remarks to help him or her feel more confident. Control yourself by not dominating every meeting with your ideas and presence. Another way to be a spiritual leader is to uplift others by expressing gratitude for their help, friendship, and presence in your life. Those who are full of gratitude lack nothing. They are filled with divine energy, complete with nothing to require for their further happiness, nothing to regret. Their spirit is whole, their life is rich beyond measure. So naturally, they are the spiritual leaders to others who feel less than perfect in their lives. Gratitude may seem an ordinary thing, but it is the touchstone of spiritual maturity and shared humanity. Showering your gratitude on others teaches them of their own fullness. One of the first ways to do so is to greet everyone with a good morning, afternoon, or evening and a smile. Keeping your mood elevated lifts everyone around you. Being kindly reminds them to show others kindness. Be the opposite of a complainer. Oh, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamasturma Bindvishavahai Om Shanti Shanti Shanti